Hey everyone, we're back with another episode of Baggies Out. It's not, it's just, not a just a podcast. Yes. I'm Zarek. I'm Zarek. I'm Zarek. All right. In this episode, we're going to show you how to change different maps on Odyssey Target and discuss the pros and cons of the different map styles. After that, we're going to go over footage of a windy launch from the 2021 U.S. Nationals and how I approached that launch. Let's roll. Woo! Let's go. Woohoo! That one seemed pretty good. We're going to go with that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, some pros and cons for satellite imagery. Uh, your pros are going to be that you can see the target uh, and, and the field surrounding your target a lot better because you got actual kind of eyes on the area. You can pick out your launch sites faster, easier because of that same, same reason. You also have street names, uh, which is nice to have when you're talking to your crews and tell them where to, where to go, where you think you're heading. Um, so they can give you your wind readings, your pie balls, uh, all that fun stuff. Uh, it's also easier to find landmarks to use as you're flying into those targets. Now on your cons, um, you do have to make the PZs yourself. So you have more prep that you got to do ahead of time. You do have to cache those map tiles, you know, zoom in, make sure that it's actually going to load for you while you're out in the field. Um, when you don't have service, potentially, uh, you do also have to clean out those cache files after a while that's uh, just so your storage doesn't get built up and become full to the point where you can't store more and then you know you're up a creek at that point so huzzah fantastic how about that perfect only a couple of them only all right go patrick tell us all about satellite maps and how to set it all up. right satellite maps here we go so we're going to change from the event map which this one is long view in this case and we're going to switch it to satellite view. So the first thing you're going to do is go up to the load button, click load map file. Uh, it's probably not going to show up here. So um, most likely it's going to be in uh, your C drive, but anywhere that you saved Aussie Explorer is where you want to go. Open up Aussie Explorer, open up maps. And then you're going to find internet maps, click uh, that folder. And you're not going to have all this stuff, but what you will have is the internet maps. And we'll, that's the one that we're going to click on. What are those other ones? Are those like cached files that you've already created with map tiles? Um, so you can kind of save different, uh, it, it's mainly for like PZ. So I have a map for any NOLA. And then my satellite view with all the PZs basically built into the map, which is kind of pretty deep into, into this. But okay. Um, I, and then I've, I made some like when I was out in Wichita where I had those PZs. So uh, I, ultimately, I've, I've switched to just one. I, like, I don't have different maps anymore. I usually just use the Indianola one. And like if I go over to, Scott's Bluff or Longview even, uh, I'm going to use that same internet-based map, and then everything PZ-wise is just going to be on that one. Gotcha. So, uh, yeah, so here we go. We got uh, our internet map uh, pulled up. Currently, it's over Indianola. That's where I fly a lot, so that's probably why it pulled up. Uh, what I was using... Or until like late last year was this Google satellite uh, imagery, which is, I think it's a better picture quality. It's probably more up to date in most cases, but it doesn't show any of the, the road names and uh, town names. So I've kind of switched over to that. My, uh, some of the guys I've been flying with, they like to use uh, road names from time to time. So I've kind of just adapted to that. And I use this virtual hybrid map, which as you can see, puts in the, the roads, the names of the town, and all that fun stuff. I definitely prefer hybrid maps whenever I'm flying, just because then if like for final landing, if I can give the crew an idea of where I'm coming in for a landing as a reference point, 
instead of just, hey, that field up there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which <Yep>. one? Yeah. <laughs> and it, it's kind of nice in the pilot briefing too, because let's say you're going to take off from, from this little you know house right here or something, you could say McKinley and 168th. You know, yeah. it's just we're gonna we're gonna meet there. Uh not a whole lot of, of thought going on. So that definitely speeds things up for finding the launch sites and just making it a lot easier. So this uh kind of going over this little box here, this is basically your control for the whole map. Uh you have a bunch of different options. Mm, the only ones that are really worth uh, getting into would be the hi Earth Hybrid and then the Google Satellite. So those are the only two that I really mess with. If you want to zoom in or out, you can click these two buttons. This tells you how zoomed in or out you are, the 16. So if you want to zoom in, the memory goes up and all that fun stuff. These uh, gray boxes that are kind of populating and then going away and showing the image. That's the cache that we were talking about um, earlier, where all these images are going to be stored on the computer. And then once you're offline, your computer pulls up that image that you basically had previously stored so that when you're flying, you can actually see, um, see that. So, uh, the, uh, there's a little bit of site prep or uh, event prep that needs to be done. And that's essentially kind of going around and zooming in to some of these places to store all these images. Uh, otherwise you're going to be flying and then you're going to get a bunch of gray boxes and won't be super useful. <laughs> how, how big, <laughs> I guess, how big is that cache or do you know um, how much, Maps you know, I mean, ability you have. I don't know. Uh, I want to say before I figured out how to clear the cache, I probably flew like three events, and then it was like I couldn't get uh, images to show, show up, so they would just be the blank boxes. <laughs> so, gotcha. uh, so big enough that you're not going to run into it, like as long as you're clearing it out semi-regularly between events, like yeah. you shouldn't run into it in the, in the same, in just one event. R right. Yep. Um, you know, obviously any NOLA and, the, and nationals are pretty big uh, or long events. So you, you're probably going to have the most uh, storage in those events. And I've never, since I've been clearing them out, I've never had a problem with uh, not being able to store the files. So uh let's see what else do we need to touch on how, how long does the uh how long will the, the the map tiles be stored how long were they how long will they be stored yeah uh so they're stored basically forever until you clear them so okay. that uh, and they'll get they'll stay there even after like a restart of the machine or anything right so if you if you close Aussie, Aussie Explorer, Aussie Target, close it completely, do a full restart of your computer, whatever you had stored previously will automatically be there and ready to go. Um, gotcha. It's really, yeah, it's, it's really just once it's full, it's not going to be able to store any new ones. So okay, cool. that's, that's, that's when you run into problems. Um, what about PZs and waypoints? So like, uh, I, I think for a lot of us, whenever we use the competition map, it already has at least PZs already on there. Um, do you, how do you put those in? Yeah. So the, the PZs themselves, and this is the map that I fly on, uh, consistently around here, you're going to have to either get a file from the event that works and I've had inconsistent uh, luck, I guess, with getting e event files that will go into Aussie and either they just won't load completely or they'll send like all of the PCs at once. And then you can't change the yellows to yellow or the reds to red. They're pretty much just all one color. So that can be a kind of a problem. 
So what I always do is I calibrate an event map and then I literally trace each PZ. Um, so I'll do all the yellows and then make that one file and then clear those, go to the red ones and, and whatever other colors. So it's, it sounds bad, but honestly, any null has a lot of uh, PZs, as you can see. And this is probably like 45 minutes of just clear or like tracing PZs, basically. So really not that bad. You can, you can watch TV and do it at the same time. Nice. So, um, yeah, and there's a little bit of work. Great points. Those can, if you have those as like a GPX, which I think most events usually send it out, you can just upload those still in the same way. Yeah. Yeah. Everything else is the same. Um, so as far as how it integrates with Aussie target, nothing changes. It, it's literally just how you're, you're going to view the screen, which is, which is pretty handy. So, cause what I like to do is, you know, when it's, if there's a, a target, uh, let's see. So for Indy Nola, anyways, there's a target. It's going to kind of pick a generic right about there. I hate that target from last year. <laughs> <laughs> I made this one. Surprisingly, that was the toughest, toughest uh, flight. That flight was um, a pain in the butt. Yeah. yeah, that was race up to 4,000 and then plummet desperately towards the, earth <laughs> yes. the target. <laughs> and, yeah, and hope that you didn't screw it up on the way down. Yeah, um, and there were gravity what, drops. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what's nice is, like, you can obviously tell that there's two houses here. Uh, it's in between them. You got a true line, which you probably wouldn't see on the event map. So... You know, we yeah. we were coming from the north. Um, granted, we were coming from four thousand feet, so we saw it pretty much <laughs> all the way. But if you know, if you were coming kind of low or something, uh, if you could pick out this the roof of this house and the roof of that house, you know, where you couldn't see it because you're flying so low, but you could see the two roofs, you could split the difference of those and get in there. That helped, yeah. which pick you know, out so reference that points would help too. Yeah, exactly. So you're probably not going to get that from the event map. You might, but most likely not. So that's that's one big advantage that I see. Do you guys fly with um, <laughs> cancel? Do you guys fly with the event maps? I, I have only been flying with the event maps. I've had people show me the satellite maps a couple times and then i always forget how to do it and so then i never go back and actually figure it out so i need to sit down and actually like yeah just learn That's the it. process yeah i'm, but I'm where, basically basically the same boat once you have it loaded up um it'll it'll always populate like this so as soon as you have it in in the the system and you can change it back by going up to load, open recent files at that point. And then like, if you want to go back to long view, we would just click long view or whatever file you're trying to get back into. And it'll open pretty soon. There we go. So we're back into the, the previous map. Um, since it's in long view, obviously the, it doesn't like, do a one for one like the the target that i put there should still be there um yeah. if i didn't delete it but uh but that's so that's kind of nice so now if i want to go right back to the satellite just do that same load and then boom we're right back so yeah once once you get into this and assuming that you don't go back to the event map when you close it it'll stay as satellite view so, because I I honestly forgot like how to go from the event map to satellite because I don't ever do it like it's just always satellite. <laughs> so the the actual satellite map here is it it's the whole Earth right versus like the 
the competition yeah. map that is usually just like a small section. Yep. So let me zoom okay. out. So you can zoom all the way out. Nice. Yep. And you can see like I have uh, this is probably Brookfield down here. Um, so like all my PZs are on this one one map. I uh, got okay. Scott's Bluff over here. And I don't know if I have long view. Maybe not. Uh, once you when you come out like this far though, it does take a little bit because there's so many different lines. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't think I have longies PZ, PZs in here. Yeah, I've just typically flown flown with the event provided map uh, as default for the majority of my competition flying so far. And then I just kind of simultaneously run either either Motion X or the Hot Air app or you know, just something like that to give me the actual ground visual in addition to the event map. So I kind of got two maps going. Yeah. But, um, but yeah. Same. Yeah. A little bit better. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, well, thanks for showing that off, Patrick. Yeah, no problem. All right. I'm glad that that harness I, <laughs> I gave you, Zarek, is holding up. <laughs> oh, it's it's a beast. That uh, it, it's it's been through. A couple of these situations now yeah and it it always makes my takeoffs very pleasurable oh good <laughs> <laughs> so did you already release your um tie off or were you um, just like kind of prepping i i've un I, I haven't undone the tie off so it's still attached to me i'm pretty sure that karen is holding the the running end though so okay. that way uh like whenever I'm ready to go, then she can release, like we can release it, but I'm not going anywhere because she has tension on it. I think. Do you normally release it yourself? Yeah, so, or do you so, it so you, can, you can see her holding it right there. Yep. Yeah. Um, so j just with a little bit of tension, I'm not going anywhere. She's not having to fight it, which is great with the figure eight, like we were saying. Do, do you normally have crew release it for you on a typical flag or do you normally do it yourself? Uh, it, it, it'll vary from some flights to others. Like, so if it's super calm and like, we're not really going anywhere, Karen or someone, a lot of the times will have already undone it. Like if they know that I'm ready to launch, um, like they have a pretty good idea of what my behavior is. And if I'm prepping for launching or whatever, um, in this situation, she's waiting on my signal and then I'll probably, I, I think I, I said like, all right, let me go. And then started adding heat in, and then she just let it slowly, slowly slide out. Gotcha. I guess on all my, all my personal balloon flights, I've always done the release myself. Yep. Um, with the ride balloons, we almost always have crew releases just because the, the, the figure eight or whatever the device is. It's, it's usually pretty far, away, right? <laughs> far away at times, yeah. So the crew typically does it then. I'm I'm thinking more about having the crew be assigned to releasing it on more windier launches like this, when I just need to be able to you know hold on to the burners and a vent line and just hammer. Yeah, it. it's it like for a day like this, it's nice to have someone on that end because now like like I, I'm aware of. Okay, yeah. So that's me undoing it right there. And now I'm going to drag a little bit, but that's why you got doubles. Yep. <laughs> you just got to use them. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So for, yeah. for that, for that situation, it's like uh, once Karen's holding on to the tail end, I'm fairly confident that she's not going to let go. Um, so <laughs> that, that lets me concentrate on the burner and getting stuff set up in the basket so that I can go. Um, and I think the main thing I was waiting on that day was just like, I, I didn't want to launch into someone or above or underneath so everyone. And so mm -hmm. I was really just waiting for cl clearance to, to get out. Yeah. Cause it really was like box wins that morning 
like heading west to east on the surface and then pop up what, what 800 feet maybe and then starting to head back to the west yeah it was pretty quick like changes that day because that was how i ended up approaching the it was the first task was a pdg i think right yeah yep yep I don't think I'm alone in this, but generally on those high wind situations, I don't bother setting the top until I've done a little bit of climb and clearing and then figured out where I want to hang out for a minute. And then I will, then I'll remember that I forgot to set it once I got up to a <laughs> proper altitude and then I'll set it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm, uh, I'm the same way. Yeah. A lot of times I won't even touch it until I need to vent. Um, just cause you get like on a racer, it's such a small balloon. There's not a lot of, there's not a lot of resistance up there. Yeah. Even if you're at equilibrium or, or climbing, um, it's easy to just go yank, yank, yank. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've, I've seen a, a lot of people, eh, maybe not a lot of people, but I've seen several people that on windy inflations, um, like this, they'll try to set the top on the and ground then, and, and, and then just lose it yeah it's like all right you you're maybe somewhat stable you're basically ready to take off and then you reset the whole thing and it's yeah like 10 times worse yep you know that then you just so, go back to fighting it all over again yeah. yeah so yeah i always just recommend if it's windy like that just forget about setting the top take off and do it when you're no yeah there 500 it is. or 500 plus <laughs> yep saw it breathe yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, the only time i'll like kind of not necessarily insist on setting the top before launch but making darn sure everything's good um which for me usually means setting the top and even testing uh is if you have a, a rapid deflation system um most racers don't i know ultra magic will build We'll build some uh, some racers with a, a rapid deflation top, but uh, I know Lindstrand doesn't offer it as an option. I don't think Cameron does either, at least uh, in the, the U, U.S. versions yeah. of those two factories, manufacturers. I, I was a little disappointed whenever I was ordering mine that I couldn't get a rapid deflation, but it's probably better that they don't because <laughs> we'd all probably do some stupid-ass shit if we had it. <laughs> some somebody would for sure <laughs> yeah no they wouldn't <laughs> oh yeah my bad <laughs> okay so you go to the cables no or, yes low. yeah yeah sorry I was misunderstanding what you were saying yeah yeah, so it goes to the That's cables cool. down at the bottom, and I prefer mine at the bottom like this as opposed to the top of the frame um, just because then I don't have anything swinging around up here. You don't want to get knocked out? Nah. It probably wouldn't knock me out. It'd just annoy me. <laughs> <laughs> It'll just slowly wear a, a, a hole in your head as it just does this. <laughs> dink, 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 dink. <laughs> And I assume you just leave the the like black strap. Yeah, that um, just always like, stays, and then I tuck it in behind my my bag here. Okay, gotcha. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna jump in there real quick. Uh, I do the same thing, but I I do I do one extra step between the harness and like you're using a figure eight there. Yep. I put a uh, a snap shackle release on the harness itself, and then I attach the figure eight. To the snap shackle, uh, just kind of as a a, a two in one factor of if if the rope ever becomes tangled on the figure eight, like if it binds itself up in a crazy knot that you can't easily undo, I can just pop the the shackle loose and then the whole thing just drops. Oh, um, interesting. And then I also uh, a lot of times I just do it that way anyways. I about I only use the eight if it's like a particularly breezy launch like this one where I need that smooth release and I don't want it to just come, you know, pop and loose and ricocheting back. Um, I'll just drop the eight and leave it tied up every time. That way I don't have to redo it. 
Um, it's just makes life a little easier sometimes. Okay. Yeah. I just always tie this up and like, there's the, I think it's pretty much the same one, but it's, uh, like I, uh, Jensen showed me a, a faster way to tie the, the figure eight. Um, I think he actually got from Anthony Lard, uh, where you basically just put the loop through the center and then put it over the ears and then you can sort of not knot it off, but like d do some sort of a, I, I do like a, basically just a daisy chain through it. So it doesn't come on, come out. Yeah. Cause really that, that's what I like about this. The, the, the figure eight is that it's, um, all that tension is on that first turn of the rope and there's like nothing on the other, on the tail end of it. So yeah, I'm going to have to check that out. It's cause I, I pretty much just do like uh so you loop it back to like the side that's tight to the truck and then Daisy chain it from there and, there's a decent amount of tension on the tail end. Oh, that this, like I I've, I've tried it out. Like, and I've had, like, I've put the, I hooked up the, 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 the webbing to, I think it may have been the basket or something like that, but like, I basically had someone holding it and leaning against the, the rope, like putting a lot of tension on this side. And then I still could like, it was, I, I could, I was barely holding on to the, to the running end like this and had like little to no tension and I wasn't moving. Hmm. Yeah. They're, they're nice. They're nice for that. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I have to check that out. Highly maybe, recommend. Maybe you can make a video sometimes, Eric, of how you tie off, tie your uh, figure eight. Yeah. That'd be a good idea. Show the world. Thanks everyone for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe in all the appropriate places. Um, if you have questions, leave a comment and we'll get to it in the next episode or a future episode. Next week, we're going to be going over some flight videos and we'll dig into why Patrick drinks so much milk. <laughs> Talk to you then. See ya. <laughs>